Well, hello again, and welcome to Loving the Scriptures with Steve Gill as we come to the final installment in our series called uh, How to Suffer Well. Um, we've spent uh, the last couple of weeks looking at 1 Peter chapter 4. Last week, we uh, we lo- uh, listened to my sermon clip uh, from that, that expounded on uh, verses... Um, I believe it was verses 14 through 18. And today we want to finish up um, this series by by examining uh, verse 19 and listening to that sermon clip and bringing this series to a close. Um, I do want to share something with you that I think is is pretty phenomenal as it relates to this uh, this whole topic. Uh, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about um, not too long ago um, because, you know, when we, when we do the things like this series, or even when we're, if we're talking about anything else as it relates to this podcast or something, sometimes if I'm talking enough about things, it makes me think, um, about the world around me and, and things that I see, things that I observe. And, um, one of the things that came to my mind, um, in the course of putting all of this together was, um, uh, was another incident. Um, and I'm trying to think how long ago this was, you know, I'm at a point now at my age where, uh, where time just flies by. So, um, I don't, I don't know if, I don't remember if this was a year ago, two years ago or, or, or whatever. Um, I I often heard a lot of people say that the older you get, the faster time goes. And I've, and I'm seeing how, how true that is. Um, but it's, it's not something that happened long, long ago, but, uh, uh, so I can still call it recent, but the, the whole thing with the, um, um, the, uh, the Christian bakers who were, uh, who were fined pretty heavily, uh, because they refused to bake a cake for, um, for a person's uh, homosexual wedding. I think it was a lesbian wedding, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, and how they, because of that, those people, the those owners of the, bake, uh, the, the bakery, they truly did suffer, folks. Um, and it was, it was a pretty big deal. Now, what I, what brought, what came to my mind as it related to that particular uh, situation was not the, response from the actual owners of the bakery because actually I, I don't really know much about what their what their response was uh, to be quite honest with you um, what I'm going by is the response from from many other Christians uh, in response to that whole thing uh, particularly um, the the things that I heard from from people who hosted Christian radio shows and things like that I um, I listen to quite a bit of, of Christian radio, although I, I don't listen to as much as I used to. Um, but uh, I remember that during that time, uh, that was a subject of conversation for uh, you know a handful of, of uh, Christian radio show hosts. And here's the here's the common thread that I heard from much of these shows. Um, it was it was these people who were sitting in front of these microphones and they were saying, um, you know, all of this has the potential of opening these problems up and this and this and this. If this continues, then this is going to happen and we're going to lose these rights. We're going to do this and and it's going to be harder to do this and we won't be able to do that and blah, blah, blah. And so I, I started I, I started hearing more and more of this whole thing, of uh, this whole talk of uh Things that we won't be able to do and, and increase persecution and what's going to happen if this or if that happens. And so um, that's the extent of a lot of what I heard, aside from just the regular explanations of what was going on in the actual situation. Um, and listen, I'm not one who relishes persecution. I don't relish the thought of possible uh increase in persecution and i would i would put uh what happened with this christian baker uh in that category of increased persecution now of course it still doesn't reach the level of persecution that you see against christians going on in other parts of the world but this this one definitely hurts 
and um, what I what I wasn't what I really had a problem with, um, and, and I, I don't know if I should say I had a problem with it. It's just something that gave me pause um, because I can understand what they're I can understand to a certain extent these people's reaction, but what what kind of caught my attention though was the fact that all I heard from these different people on these radio shows was just lamenting about what could possibly come upon us as a Christian community in this nation. If things continue, if, if things, if the trends continued in the way that they did. And I thought, you know what, we could find better things to do with our time as it relates to this situation. We can do, uh, we, there are better ways to spend our time and there are better things that we can do than just sitting around microphones and complaining and lamenting because, and, and here's where we kind of make the scriptural comparisons here. Um, what I hear when I hear things like I did on the radio station, uh, on these radio shows, um, what I heard were, were people who I question in my mind, whether these are people who knew how to suffer well. Um, now, like I said, I understand why they react the way that they do just in seeing what, if things continue the way they do, um, what sort of effect this might have on people in their Christian lives down the road. But when you look at things and compare it with scripture, one of the things that you don't see and you don't hear about are Christians who are in the midst of persecution, who just sit and complain about uh, the hardships that they're suffering. You don't, you don't hear the, the apostles or any other Christian in the early church saying, man, do you, did you, did you hear what those people did to me or what they said to me? And man, that's just awful. Can you imagine if things get worse, the kind of things that we're going to not be able to do? And you didn't see any of that. And, and in the, in this final sermon clip that you're going to hear, today you're going to you're going to uh, we're going to see an example of a a very biblical reaction to the suffering that the apostles um that the apostles um when they experienced persecution the reaction that they had um and quite honestly it's a reaction that i think is woefully missing um in our christian society today um so i hear about you know i i can't help but observe how people think about persecution in our own day and compare it to how other people approached persecution in the scriptures and listen very carefully and how other Christians in other parts of the world who are suffering much worse than we do um, handle persecution. And on that note, I want to share something with you real quick. I want to share with you um, a, a short article in uh, last month's edition of The Voice of the Martyrs. And let me tell you something. The Voice of the Martyrs, reading some of the things that I read in there, I I get so inspired and encouraged by some of these people who, um, uh, who suffer tremendously for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, a lot of times these are people who suffer in, in much... Uh, uh, heavier ways than we do here. Um, and listen, that's that's not something that we should, uh, it's not anything a fault of our own. That's just the situation that we're in right now versus the situation that they're in. But um, it really makes you stop and think about, um, you know, how if we, if we, if we consider the level of persecution that we suffer in our country, and we don't suffer well in that lower level of persecution. And we look at people who are, who are suffering much, much worse things as far as persecution goes. And we see just how they handle themselves in persecution. Um, and just in, in, the, in an inspiring, in the inspiring way that they do, that really says something significant about our culture, does it not? I mean, um, how is it that that in a lot of circles in Christianity today, when it comes to persecution, 
we crumble and we groan and we complain. Um, and then we have people who are suffering physical persecution, people who are being thrown in jail and, um, and, and being beaten. Churches, church buildings are being burned and yet they maintain their joy and they, and they still want to just go out and reach the world for Christ. It's truly amazing. And I've, you know, I love our church here in the United States. Um, but really, I think that the churches, as small and as and as haggard as they are in other places of the world, really puts the church in the United States to shame. They really, really do. Um, but I want to read this article not to not to heap shame, um, but I, I but I, I hope it inspires you as much as it inspired as it inspired me. Okay, and this whole the whole. This whole edition of, of the Voice of the Martyrs seem to be um, dedicated to uh, the things that are that things that are going on in the country of Sudan, where Christians are suffering heavily, and all throughout this magazine, this edition of this magazine, they just had these little short articles uh, covering different things about um, persecution um, in uh, in Sudan, and I just want to read you one of these here, um, and. Uh, it, uh, it says this, it says, imagine sitting in your church, listening to the pastor's sermon and suddenly feeling a rush of adrenaline as you and those around you begin to recognize the familiar whine of a plane approaching. In an instant, everyone runs for cover, leaping into foxholes and seeking shelter behind rocks. Four of the most dangerous places to be in the Nuba Mountains are church buildings, schools, hospitals, and fields of crops. Sudanese government, government bombers target the shiny roofs of buildings and anything resembling a field of crops that might be used to help sustain those living nearby. They want them out of the region or dead. Although their church buildings have been bombed and they face continual threat of attack, Believers in the Nuba Mountains continue to gather faithfully for worship. In their ongoing difficulties, they have no one and nothing to depend on but God. They pray day and night, knowing their lives might be taken at any moment. And Christians in the region have countless opportunities to share Christ with the Muslims who flee the bombings with them. Pastor Mata, who works in the Nuba Mountains, said, quote, Because of persecution... Because of hatred, because of a lot of things against us, it made us more. It, it it made more Muslims open to hear and listen to the gospel. End quote. So Christians continue to worship in the Nuba Mountains, encouraging one another and pointing Muslim neighbors to Christ. Now, listen, I find that article absolutely amazing, and I hope you do as well. Um, these are people who were who were suffering intensely, but there's a, there's a few things that I want you to take note of in your mind, and this is kind of kind of serve as a preview for what we're going to hear in this final sermon clip on suffering. Well, um, take note of did you take note of um, the one sentence I read where it says, um, "In their ongoing difficulties, they have no one and nothing to depend on but God." Okay, keep that in your mind. Um, also keep in mind um, the next for the, the excuse me, the next sentence. They pray day and night. Knowing uh, knowing their lives might be taken at any moment, they pray day and night. So keep so keep in mind that their dependency on God and their and their continual prayer. Um, and also keep in mind um the very next sentence after that, where it says, and Christians in the region have countless opportunities to share Christ with the Muslims who, feed, who flee the bombings with them. So you have people who are dependent on God, they're continue, they continue in prayer, and they keep focused on their task of preaching the gospel. They didn't let the things that were happening to them, as, as bad as they were, deter them from what they really knew that they needed to do. And so I, I, I asked this question in my own mind and mull this over in your own head too and think and, and see what you can come up with in, with in your own mind. Ask yourself this question. What if the things that happen in places like Sudan happen on a regular basis here in churches all across the United States? 
what would the react the general reaction be from Christians in the church in America today? Now think about it. Do you think that in large part it would be like these Sudanese Christians? Now again, I'm not saying that they, that these Sudanese Christians are better Christians because they go through the suffering that that we don't. I mean, the the our level of persecution that suffered or isn't suffered between one country or culture and another isn't something that anybody can take pride in or find fault in. It's just the it's just the way things are at this moment. But uh, again, you come back to the whole thing of how is it that. Um, we here in the West who suffer significantly less don't handle persecution as well as people in other parts of the world. Do you think that in our country, if we if we suffered to the level of uh, to the level that as people in Sudan do did, what what do you think that our the general Christian reaction would be now? You might have a lot of people who really do suffer well, and I have to examine my own heart, to be quite honest with you, and I hope that you would as well, and ask yourself that, how would you react and how would you respond? Would you react biblically and be somebody who suffered well, Um, or or would it be something totally different? Now, in a general sense, when we think about the church at large and how they approach persecution, um, you, you know, you have to wonder, you know, it it makes you wonder sometimes, because again, it's just that comparison of even when we suffer less, we seem to not handle persecution very well. So, um, so yeah, just, so just keep that in mind because I think that serves as a good preview of of some of the things that um, I'm going to cover as we, as we finish up. And as we look at verse 19 of first Peter four, Okay, so we're going to go ahead and and get into the sermon clip. And then what I want to do um, when I when we get back um, and I'll try and do this as quickly as we can, um, I want to cover a, a portion of scripture in the book of Acts. Um, it gives us a, a narrative example um, of what it looks like to suffer well. So we'll listen to the sermon clip, then we'll come back and we'll close things off um, with a with a biblical narrative example of suffering well. And so as we come to a conclusion, this is where, this is where I feel, I, I got a confession to make. As I was preparing for this sermon, every time I was going through verse 19, I got this, I got this stirring in my heart as I'm, as I'm just breaking down this verse because, well, let's read it again and I'll explain what I mean. Verse 19, he says, so then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. And I guess the reason why when I read that and when I've studied that, I get so stirred up because the church in America is so far from that. And it breaks my heart. What's Peter saying here? Those who suffer according to God's will. Peter mentioned God's will earlier in the chapter. He says that, uh, that we don't uh, live for uh, earthly, uh, earthly human desires, but rather for the will of God. He says in verse 3 that you spend enough time doing what the pagans do. And he lists off a, a list of things that pagans were doing in their pagan rituals and their pagan rites and, and everything like that. You spend enough time doing those things. You're not living for that anymore, but you're living for the will of God. And then in verse 4, it says, they think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you. They heap abuse on you. Why? Because you look weird. You don't do the things that they do. Living according to God's will is so diametrically opposed to the things of this world and the things of, of, that these pagans were doing. And the pagans are looking at that and they're saying, you guys are weird, and they heap abuse on them. And there, there again is that, that warning that when you live according to God's will, you will suffer. Now here's, here's what I want to say as it relates back to Chick-fil-A. Um, one of the things that I heard 
on more than one occasion. I kept hearing over and over again as people are interviewed about this whole Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day. question is asked, why are you going out and, and, and buying chicken at, at Chick-fil-A? Why are you making this stand? And let me just preface what I'm about to say by saying this. Buying chicken in and of itself, it's not bad. I mean, it's Christians who went out and bought chicken. They really didn't do anything wrong. And there are some Christians like, well, I'd like to give my support to this person. And, and you know, in a way, I think that's okay. But when, I, when you look at the big picture and just kind of the whole outlay of how this thing is, is portrayed and how it's communicated, that's where I have the problem. But you have the, this overwhelming response from people who are asked this question, why did you do what you did in going and buying chicken at Chick-fil-A? And everybody was saying, well, we, we, we're just in support of Dan Cathy, and we're, and we're here to support free speech. That's one thing I kept hearing, free speech, free speech. We're for free speech. Listen, free speech isn't the issue, okay? Dan Cathy was free to say what he said, and he did say it, didn't he? He suffered the consequences for it, but he said it. And, you know what? He's free to say it again. Nobody's going to stop him if he wants to say it again. Free speech is not the issue, folks. So you realize what people are asking society to do in light of this? This is, this is the demand that many Christians are making of society. They're saying, society, let us speak God's truth and God's word in our nation without being harassed, hassled, reviled, or insulted. Folks, that is never going to happen. That will never happen. What we're asking for is, let us speak God's truth without suffering the cost. You can't do it. As long as you live according to God's will, they will heap abuse on you. Expect it. Get ready for it. And my personal thoughts... I don't know if anybody else shares this, but this is my own personal thoughts. We see things like Chick-fil-A and things similar to it. Guys, I think this is just the beginning. Things are going to get worse. I'm sorry. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that's that's just the reality of it. That's just the way it is. So prepare yourself. But thankfully, Peter gives us a manual, right, on how to suffer well. And he gives us and he gives us a perspective. And so he says, those who suffer according to God's will, here again, should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. That word commit themselves, in the Greek, that's a, that's a banking term. It, it, he's saying deposit yourself. Deposit yourself to your, to your faithful creator. Man, oh man, that's, 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 that's a powerful, powerful statement. You want to see a good example. This is one of my favorite examples of this. And I'm almost done, don't worry. But look real quickly at uh, Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and and John had received persecution from the Sanhedrin, basically because they were preaching in the name of Jesus, right? And so in verse 23, this is what it says, On their release... Peter and John went back to their own people and reported, all that, and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in complaint. How dare they? We'll show them. We'll, we'll make a statement. That's one thing that, that people were so proud of with the Chick-fil-A thing. They thought they made a statement because they were, you know, because people came out in droves to buy chicken. So they thought that they were making this big statement. What did the people do here? Did they complain among themselves? Did they say, let's make a statement of our own? No. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. When something like Chick-fil-A happens or something similar to it, how often is it that you hear Christians say, let's get together and let's pray because we're under attack? I don't know about you, but I hardly ever hear that at all. We don't commit ourselves to our faithful creator And they had the whole creation thing in mind, by the way. They go on and they say, they lift their 
the, their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. They're saying, you're the creator of everything. If you want to see a good parallel to the whole thing about creation and God creating and, and God sustaining you during, during times of trouble and persecution, look at Isaiah 51, 12 through 16. Tremendous, tremendous passage. But basically what he's saying is that, Lord, if you're powerful enough to bring the heavens and the earth into existence, is it too small for you to protect your people when the, when the heat gets turned up? They knew who their power source was, and so you see, they committed themselves to their faithful creator. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. He quotes from Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. So there again, there's, there's, again you see that reminiscent thing of we shouldn't be surprised at this. Your word said this was going to happen, and we even see it with what happened with your servant Jesus. Not surprised, right? Now, Lord, verse 29, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great Boldness, stretch out your hand and heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Where is the prayer like this in our church? Where is it? You know what happens? Funny thing, they pray, guess what happened? God showed up. He showed up, verse verse 31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And if you read through Acts, you see them dispatching the truth of God's word and they turned the world upside down. They committed themselves to their faithful creator and they got results. Here we have people going and getting in line and saying, didn't we make a statement by buying chicken? Let me tell you something. These people didn't buy chicken, metaphorically speaking. Chicken wasn't their concern. It grieves me like you wouldn't believe. And it's not, it's not simply a matter of it's not simply a matter of we we went and we supported. It, it's it's and again, I don't know if you if you heard and, and listened to and watched the same things that but the but the idea is we really showed them which is really a prideful attitude. We, we really should, who needs God? We don't need to commit ourselves to them. We're going to come out, we're going to make a statement. And really, what, 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 is, what resulted? What got done? Nothing, really. You had a response on this one side, and then you had the other side saying, well, we're going to have a kiss-in day at Chick-fil-A. And in case you didn't know, they had something else planned where they're going to, going to support all these businesses uh, you know, that were homosexual friendly, like Starbucks and stuff like that. So now we got this back and forth going, and nothing gets done. Why? Because we don't commit ourselves to our creator. Because we don't think he's powerful enough, honestly, I think. We don't think he's powerful enough to really sustain us and to have his truth go out among the people. I truly believe that. We had to have a reversal of thinking. And then finally, committing yourselves, he says, you should commit, you know, commit yourselves to your faithful creator and continue to do good. Now, what does that mean, this whole thing of continuing to do good? That's another thing that Peter mentions. That's what he talks about pretty much throughout this majority of this epistle. In chapter 2, verse 11, he says, I urge you aliens, as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. In verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So there he says they may, that they may see your good deeds and that it might have an effect and might glorify God on the day that he visits us. Now, what's, what are these good deeds that he's talking about? What are you talking about, Peter? Peter says, I'm glad you asked. Let me show you. And he goes on in saying, starting in verse 13 and following, he's saying, Submit yourselves to every authority that's instituted among men. So have a good relationship with your government and submit to them 
as long as it doesn't violate God's will, I think that's a given. Submit yourselves to your, to your government. And then in verse 15 he says, For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. So be in submission to your government. Verse 18 he says, Slaves, be, be, uh, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and kind ones, but also to those who are harsh. So you have this whole thing of do good as it relates to your relationship with government. And here, I mean, for us, we don't have slavery here, but a lot of people kind of equate it to your employer-employee relationship. So you have this whole thing as it relates to your government, as it relates to your place of employment. He continues in verse 3, and he, and he goes into the home. What does this look like in the home? Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. This is how they made, this is how the holy women of the past made themselves beautiful. Here's that outward expression of what's going on with their good deeds inside the home. Husbands in the same way, be considerate to your wives. Verse 7. So do good as it relates to your government, your place of employment, your family, and with the members of the church. Chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. And then as he gets down to verse 13, he says, who's going to harm you? We read this before, if you are eager to do good. But even if you should suffer for what is good, for, for, uh, for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But, and here's the clincher, and here's where we're going to kind of land the plane here. But, verse 15, in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Now, he just got done quoting Isaiah 8.12. Even though he ended the, the quote, He's really following through with what Isaiah continues to say in that chapter because he says that, you know, pretty much saying that regard God Almighty as holy in the following verse in in Isaiah 8.13. He says, in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And you know what? We look at this passage and and we say, you know, this is, we should really take this to heart because if I'm living out my Christian life and, um, you know, somebody comes up, and to, comes up to me and says that there's something different about you. What is it? I've always noticed you. I've always watched you. And there's something, there's just something different about you. What is it? And they apply this verse and they say that, well, you know, you should, you know, be ready when somebody asks you that question. And a lot of times it's under the thought that says, um, my, my identity in Christ is a secret. They really don't know what makes my life good. And when they ask me, that's when I spring it on them. But that's really not, I mean, in, in a way, I mean, you should always be prepared to, you know, give a hope, give an answer to the gospel and, and everything like that. But you realize in context, Peter is saying, be prepared to give an answer in the context of suffering. That's really the true context of what Peter is saying. And we know that it's not something that's secretive where people don't know that they're identified with Christ because that's why they're suffering. So they know they belong to Christ, but they see their identification with Christ. They see that they're suffering abuse, insults, persecution. They continue to stand firm, and they have a hope. And that looks so unusual to people in the outside world and they say, I got to tell you, you identify yourself with Christ and you just keep getting beat up. What gives, dude? What, 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 what's going on there? And there we say, he says that be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. And the hope that, that is spoken of there, yes, it's, it's the gospel. and You can give a gospel presentation, but you know what that hope also includes? That hope includes the hope of the glory that will be revealed. And again, that's something that Peter mentions over and over and over again. The hope that we have when Jesus Christ comes back. And he says, I have this hope because I know that my Savior is going to come down from heaven. And he's going to rescue me. And he's going to punish all those people who have, who have done us wrong and insult us, insulted us and reviled us. And just to take it a little step further, you know what you can say? You can say, you know what? What category do you want to be in? I mean, you can open up a way to share the gospel. There you get something done. Right? And he says, be prepared for that because you have an opportunity there. 
but do this with gentleness and respect. Don't be mean. Don't be, don't be rude. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. We can make people ashamed of the slander that they've given to us because of our testimony of Christ, both in word and deed. Not so much because we went to buy chicken. Now again, I mean, in and of itself, that's not bad, but like in the big picture, people are saying, yeah, we made a statement. Well, guys, look, look at the manual. It's right here. And I see the potential of greater results doing it this way than in so many other ways that Christians have chosen to do it. Okay, so thus concludes our um, our uh, examination of how to suffer well from First Peter four in the in the sermon clips. I hope that uh, I hope that uh, these uh, last few podcasts have really spoken to you and that you've been able to glean uh, some truth from that. I just want to do a, a, a few quick things. Number one, um, again, just one more time, I wanted to um, uh, mention the, my book, Changing the Method of Change, because again, some of the things or the concepts rather um, of suffering well, even though it's not the central uh, part of the book, it does play in well to the the whole outlay of what I what I try and and, uh, and uh, speak about in that book. Um, it I talk about that in changing the method of change, uh, which I which I published back in two thousand nine. So again, if there's a, if you're interested in in picking up a copy, uh, ordering a copy, you can order that off of the publisher's website, which is zulonpress.com and Zulon again. Is spelled X U L O N. So Zulon Press, X U L O N Press dot com. Search for me by name, Steve Gill, or by the title, Changing the Method of Change, whatever you do, it should pop up for you. So um, so if you want to order that, you can order that off of that website. Um, I wanted to reemphasize something. Um, that I that I mentioned there in that in the, in this last piece, because one thing that I want us to understand is that uh, even in the midst of persecution, we should have a continually have an evangelistic mindset, and that's kind of something that you saw with the article that I that I um, that I read to you earlier um, about uh, those Christians in Sudan who were. Uh, ever mindful of opportunities to continue to share Christ with the Muslims around them. Um, and Peter kind of hints at the same thing here um, as it relates to, to suffering and being prepared to uh, give an answer for the hope that lies within you. Um, it's a very, uh, that that verse, which again is is in uh, 1 Peter um, chapter 3, um, verse 15, um, always being ready to give a, um, well, let me read it here. And I'm reading it from the English Standard Version um, here. Um, chapter chapter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ uh, the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Verse 16, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. There's so much there. And I don't have time to really go into go into all of that. And maybe we'll, we'll maybe we'll take some time to uh, look at those two verses um, at some at some point down the road. Uh, but again, I just want to reemphasize the, the whole thing here of of what it says about uh, being prepared to make defense to anyone who asks you for the uh, for the reason for the hope that is in you, and again, as I mentioned that in that uh, in that sermon piece, is that the true context of that of that verse is being prepared to do that in the midst of suffering. See, we a lot of times we we take that verse and we say and we take it to mean whenever somebody asks when we live our lives in Christ. Uh, when we live a good life around somebody and they hopefully come up and they ask us, um, 
what makes our life so good because they've watched the way that we lived and we and they notice that there's something different about us and they ask what is it about that about you that makes you so different and then you and then you go on and you explain to them the gospel and that's you know being prepared for that moment when somebody asks you that now of course that's you know that's something that's valid you can certainly you should certainly be prepared to give an answer to somebody about the way that about uh, why you're why you're so different uh, from everybody else? Um, that's certainly a valid thing to do. Um, I don't think, though, um, I, I don't think that that's a a common thing that happens, though, because um, a lot of times the way people operate in the church is that they intentionally, and this is a good thing. This this part is a good thing. They intentionally uh, want to be a live their testimony in Christ in front of other people, in front of non-believers, whether it be um, at, at their workplace or wherever, or in their neighborhood or, or, or whatever. Um, and that's certainly good. But here's the thing. There are some people, and I've heard this uh, from time to time, um, and I don't think it's an uncommon thing where people say, I want to live my life in Christ around people so that it comes to the point where people ask me about my life. And then I have that opportunity to share the gospel. Now, um, now I, I I continue to yield myself over to the Holy Spirit so that He lives in me, so that um, people will be able to see God's life living in me. Here's the thing, though, and we we I don't think that we can totally operate on the whole thing of as long as I continue to live my life in Christ around non-believers that I know, it'll come to a point where they'll ask me what makes me different. Truth of the matter is, I think that that scenario is is pretty rare. Um, you don't get a lot of people who will just say, hey, you know what? I've noticed something about you. Um, now, it does happen. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It does. Um, but I, I don't I, I don't really think that it's a common thing where they say, tell me why you're so different from everybody else. And so that being the case, we have a lot of Christians who are rightly trying to live in in Christ around non-believers, and they're just waiting for the for that golden question um, to for them to ask them about their life. Now and then they'll and then they'll share the gospel. Now the problem is if nobody asks that question, then the gospel doesn't get shared. Um, and so that's you know so you kind of have something there where people are continuing to live their lives and. The question is it being asked with as long as the question is not being asked and the gospel is not being preached. Um, so but anyway, that's how we normally look, uh, interpret something like first Peter three. And I think in a way in our society, it's kind of natural that we do that, because, again, our level of persecution in this society, in our culture, is on a much lower scale than in other places in the world. Um, but we need to understand that. It, Contextually, in that verse, what Peter is talking about is somebody asking that question in the context of suffering. So in other words, they're seeing somebody who is truly suffering greatly for the cause of Christ, and yet they continue to maintain their joy. They continue to maintain their fidelity to Christ and to everything having to do with the gospel. And that's just unnatural. See, from a human point of view, somebody's just going to, it's just going to think, man, why don't you just get out of that? You are, you are suffering so much abuse and yet you're continuing to stick around. It would seem to make more sense if you just threw up your hands and said, that's it, I'm done with this because I'm tired of getting kicked around. But people of the world are looking at this and saying, that's not what's happening with these people. And that's truly unusual, again, from a human point of view. So that's when people go up to these Christians and they, and they ask to ask them to give a reason for the hope that you have. Because and and the, and the implication is that they understand what the hope is. The hope is that Christ is going to come back and He's going to establish righteousness. I mean, if you look at the whole context of of First Peter, that's what that's what you understand things to be. Um, and so, notice that that verse says um, to um, to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So again, that implies that they understand what the hope, what their hope is, but they're, but they're asking the question, why do you have such a hope? 
you know, what is it about this hope that makes it so grand and wonderful that you that you continue to stick with that hope instead of just giving up and throwing in the towel and saying this this whole Christianity thing isn't for me. That's really what it's getting at. So really, it, when it comes to this verse, this really isn't a matter of living my life in front of people in a good manner and then waiting for somebody to ask me about it. The The implication of, the, of this verse is that the people who ask the question already know that they're Christians. They already know that they have a life in Christ. They already know, you know, that they that they've established themselves um, in a life in Christ. It's just a matter of in that life in Christ, they're suffering tremendously and they're continuing to hang on. Um, and so they're saying, what's the deal? Why are you why are you doing that? So I think it's important to to understand that. And so uh, the the end, uh, the end goal in all of this, I mean, as far as that's concerned, is evangelistic. And I think that that's very important as well. Um, I, I think it's important for us to have an evangelistic mindset when it comes to things, even in the midst of persecution. Because the thing that in our society is, is that I think that when it comes to persecution of whatever level, um, we tend to focus more on that. And then try we try and figure out a way how to how to dispel the persecution, and then we can get back onto the mission that we've been called to do. And that's really not uh, the, biblically. That's really not the way that we should approach things. Um, Paul was one who said that he dared to preach the gospel to the Thessalonians, even in the midst of uh, in even in the midst of opposition. Um, so it's not a matter of you know let, uh, having this persecution as a distraction to what we've been called to do as a church. Um, we, even when we face opposition, we are to continue to go out and preach the message, um, to people who will hear us. It doesn't, you know, I don't necessarily think it means that we have to try and enforce the gospel on people who are coming against us. Um, you know, we just shake the dust off our feet and move on as far as that's concerned with, with those, with those certain people. Um, but we continue on with what we've been called to, what we've been called to do, um, and doing it all to the glory of God. Now, let me close um, by uh, um, sharing with you real quickly um, from Acts chapter 16. And this kind of has that, just what I mentioned just a few seconds ago, um, having this whole thing of the evangelistic mindset and this um, whole thing of, of reaching people for Christ, even when it comes to being in the midst of persecution and opposition. Because Paul and Silas suffered this. So in, in Acts chapter 16, this is when, when Paul and Silas are in Philippi and um, they, uh, they have this problem um, as they're going about, as they're going about their, their business in Philippi. And it's, and it's this demon possessed woman um, who through this spirit is able to tell the future. And um, it's, I believe it's a, it was a, a slave woman um, as this, as the story goes. And um she kept harass. Uh, I mean, harassing. And, you know that that might, might might not be the correct term, but she was certainly bothering Paul and Silas, uh, following them around and um, and just causing all sorts of problems um, problems for them. And in fact, one of the things that uh, it says here in chapter sixteen, verse seventeen, it says uh, she followed Paul and us, crying out. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation, um, which I, at first glance, we, we might look at that and think, well, isn't that a good thing that she's saying that? But having the testimony of salvation from the mouth of demons is not what you want. Um, and that's something that bothered uh, Paul and his companions. And so it bothered him so much to the point uh, where he turned around and and uh, and in verse 18, you see how he drives the demon out of um, out of the woman. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Um, and so this causes uh, this is bad news for the person who owns this woman because he received a great deal of money through this woman's fortune telling. And now that the spirit is gone and she no longer tells fortunes, uh, he, he loses his profit. Um, so Paul and Silas end up getting arrested. They, they, uh, um, the, um, the crowd was, was kind of against them as well. Uh, there was this whole stirring up of trouble over all of this. Um, verse 22 says the crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave them orders to beat them with rods. 
Verse 23, And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So it wasn't even just a matter that they were just locked up. I mean, they were locked up and they put their feet in the stocks, so they couldn't go anywhere even within their cell. Um, and the way I understand it, if I understand it correctly, I mean, the stocks were, it wasn't even just something that was was kept around your ankles to keep you stationary. But I mean, I, I think it had it, they had it where you're laying on the floor and you're stretched out in a very uncomfortable way and then fastened down. So uh, this was uh, this was bad news to say the least, just as far as the circumstances uh, that Paul and Silas were going through all for driving out a demon um, out of a woman, which caused a lot of grief for this guy who who got a lot of money from her fortune telling. Now he lost his, his profit and now um, he turns them into the authorities and this is all that happens to them. And they got beaten. They got beaten with rods. Now, the whole injustice of this whole thing um, is, is, is compounded if you understand that there is supposed to be a legitimate invest, investigation that, that goes on to any sort of charge like this. But that didn't happen. So they're immediately seized, they're beaten, and they're thrown in prison. Now, notice what the attitude is of Paul and Silas in this. So in verse 25, it says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the and listen, and the prisoners were listening to them. Isn't that something? We might look at something like Paul and Silas and say, You two have absolutely nothing to sing about. Nothing, absolutely nothing. But here you have Paul and Silas in this situation, which is far from ideal, right? Far from ideal. And it says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. So there's the, there's the prayer aspect there. Remember we talked about, about prayer. We heard about that in the, in the sermon piece a few minutes ago. They were praying, but not only were they praying, uh, but they were singing hymns to God. They were still worshiping God. You know, the, the, the circumstances didn't take away their joy and their desire to worship God and lift up his name. And so the fact that these prisoners were listening to them is pretty key because uh, they're probably wondering what's going on. And they and they later on are going to be audience to Paul and Silas as they preach the gospel, because as the story goes on, there's an earthquake. The 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 shackles fell off of them um, and uh, the doors flew open and, and everything. And so um, everybody is, has a chance of escaping. They Everybody has this opportunity of, of pulling a Richard Kimball, um, for those of you who like the fugitive. Uh, but Paul is one who who sticks around. The jailer looks around. He sees all the doors open. He says, "Oh no, I'm in trouble," because he it, it really w- was bad news if he let all the pr- if he let all the prisoners escape. That's not a good thing when you're a Roman guard guarding prisons. And so he was going to kill himself. I mean, much better in his mind to kill himself than to uh, be put uh, into the hands of the people who would hold him responsible for uh, for the prisoners. But um, um. In verse 28, it says, but Paul cried at, cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. So Paul stuck around. He didn't escape. He didn't run. And look at this. And it says in verse 29, and the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembled and trembling with fear. He fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so from there, you see that, uh, see everything that, uh, um, uh, that unfolds. Uh, just as far as the, uh, just as far as is him hearing the gospel. Um, so that's pretty amazing. And, um, you know, it says in verse 31 and they, and, and they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in uh, all who were in his house, um, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, you know, I don't have to read the rest of the passage, but there I just see somebody who uh, seems to, uh, Paul and Silas, two people who suffered well and who seem to um, uh, look at things from an evangelistic point of view. And, you know, I, I only wish I, I wish I only knew 
what their prayer was. Because again, it said that they were praying and singing hymns. Um, I wonder if one of their prayers was uh, that they would have an opportunity to preach the gospel to the people in the prison and to the jailer. I don't know. The text doesn't say. Um, you know, all I know is that Paul was one who, who prayed for opportunities. You see that in Colossians 4. And in the narrative sense, you see the, that prayer answered at the end of Acts um, in Acts chapter 28. Um, and how even in, from his prison letters in books like Philippians, he says that the, the gospel was spreading all throughout the prison, uh, uh, all throughout the prison guard and, um, and things like that. So I wonder if that was one of his prayer requests when he was praying to God. Um, who knows? I, I don't know. Again, that I'm just speculating on that. But you can't help but, but notice the attitude, the behavior of Paul and Silas, even in, even in the face of injustice, because again, this was a very unjust thing that they were going through. Even though the way that the court system and the magistrates, how they handled things was not the way it was supposed to be handled. And now they're behind bars and there they are in the stocks um, praying and singing hymns to God. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So let's, let's, let's take to heart that, that example and, uh, and let's even pray for ourselves and say that, Lord, may, as you fill us and strengthen us with your spirit, may we have the same attitude as Paul and Silas did. And may that be a testimony to those around us so that when we do suffer and we, and we demonstrate the hope that we have in you, that it really does a, a it really does great things in contributing to drawing people closer to salvation rather than draw, uh, rather than driving them further away from it. Okay, so um, so we'll go ahead and, and call it quits there. Like I said, I hope you enjoyed um, uh, the series that we had on how to suffer well. So uh, next time we'll get into uh, we'll get into some other another topic and uh, another another passage of scripture. I admittedly don't know what that's going to be, so um, so I guess it's going to be a surprise. Uh, for you when, you when you come back next time. But whatever it is, um, I'm sure that we'll have, we'll have a great time together um, and that we'll truly get something out of it. So my name is Steve Gill. I've enjoyed our time together and I will see you next time. Bye now.